Hi, FBC students. You guys caught me drinking water. <laughs> I thought the video was a little bit longer. So last week, Pastor Billy spoke about a message called, how many of you remember what it was about? No. <laughs> it was about healthy emotions. So if you guys weren't here last week, he spoke about having healthy emotions and being the triangle, like having that triangle thing so that you're strong enough. So it was a great message. This week, we're going to be speaking about healthy um, emotions. So when you guys hear the word health um, emotions, I used to just think it was happiness, anger, being sad. I used to think those were emotions and that that was all it was to it. So when Pastor Billy said, Ahana, you're going to be preaching on emotions next week. I thought, oh my goodness, I am pregnant. Emotions right now is not what I should be preaching on. Because when you're, I feel like my emotions are everywhere. So God spoke to me and said, this is the perfect moment. Because it shows that you need me in order to conquer your emotions. You can't do it on your own. So emotions start in what your mind is consumed by. So can you guys say consumed? So that's what your mind, whatever takes over your mind, that's consumed. So that's what emotions are. So I'm going to sound a little bit like a teacher. We're all back in school, so that's okay. How many of you still do vocabulary words? Yeah? I used to love vocabulary words. But okay, I'm going to sound like a teacher because I'm going to go over two words that help me understand what emotions are and where they came from. So what are emotions and how do they work? So emotions, ooh, look at Jonathan. Okay, emotions are a neural impulse that moves an organism to action, prompting automatic reactive behavior that has been adapted. So this sounds very complicated, but basically it's saying that it's a, it's a nerve in your brain that gets reactive by a living being. So anything living moves to an action and an automatic reactive behavior that has been adapted. So that's what emotions are. And then the meaning of adapt is to become adjusted to new conditions. Okay, so I want you to keep these two words in your mind so that later on when we go into the message, you know um, why it is important. So something that I learned is that the way the world wants us to adapt um, is to a technique called Emotion regulation. Can you guys say emotion regulation? Who knows what that means? I want to see if anybody knows what that means. No? Okay, good. So you're going to learn something. Oh, you know what it means? Okay. <laughs> so you guys are all going to learn something. So emotion regulation is that you control your emotions. Basically, psychologists say that if you use this technique, it just means that you regulate. So when you feel happy, it goes up. When you're sad, it goes down. So you're basically the one regulating your emotions. And that's why so many teenagers, children, and even adults struggle because we can't do it on our own, like I was saying earlier. So emotion regulation is a difficult thing, but the world says that's how you conquer emotions. So I was praying. I was like, God, I need you to show me how we conquer emotions and how we have healthy emotions. So I'm a huge note taker, huge, and I want everybody taking notes. If your excuse is you don't have paper, grab the, one, the yellow one next to you. Everybody has a yellow paper next to them. If you don't, you're not following the rules. You're supposed to have a yellow paper next to you. And if you need a pen, raise your hand, and one of the leaders are going to give you a pen because I want everybody to take notes and remember this and use this and apply it. So I'm going to pray. If you need a pen, you can raise your hand, and the leaders will bring it to you. So, Father God, I thank you for this night. I pray that you use me. I pray that these students would have ears to listen and a heart to receive. I thank you because you gave me this message for each and every one of them. And I just pray that we would laugh and we would enjoy and just love being in your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, another thing before I get to it. Like I said earlier, I am pregnant and I run out of breath. Me talking feels like I just ran a marathon. So if I need to catch my breath, I'm just going to let everybody breathe in with me and breathe out. And if I drink just like that, Bryce, just like that, <laughs> I need to breathe like and let it out. Because I am speaking and I feel like I am running out of breath. So 
What God showed me about the way to live to have healthy emotions is that there's two ways to live that we can choose. The first one is the unhealthy emotion, and the second one is the healthy. So I'm going to be speaking about the first one, which is the flesh. So what is the flesh? The flesh is full of passions and desires. So that's what our nature wants to do. So even though we weren't made and created to be led by the flesh, the world belongs to the enemy. So our natural thing to want to do is react out of the flesh. So that's out of things that the world wants us to like and things that we're consumed by and all our passions and desires. That's what the flesh is. So when you live by the flesh, you are full of unhealthy emotions because your body is adapting to the things of this world, which is to react based on what you're thinking and how you feel. So we're going to go over a character in the Bible that was one of the most emotional people ever. Okay, how many of you are emotional? Just be honest, there's only a few of us in here. Yeah, we can all be emotional. So Peter, I mean, this guy, man, I wanted to not give it away, but I gave it away. Peter was one of the most emotional people I've ever met in the Bible or in person. He was so emotional. So I'm going to take you guys on a journey with me to get to know why Peter was emotional. So the first thing I want you guys to read with me is Matthew 16, 16 through 20. It says, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Here comes the breath. <laughs> okay. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was Christ. So basically, this is the moment that Peter declared and recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. So this is important for us to know because it shows us where Peter was at. So, okay, he understands it's Jesus. So we're going to go to Matthew 16, 21 through 25. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What I learned from here is that after Peter realized who Jesus was, he still had the guts to tell him that would never happen to you. And when we read this, I think, wow, but Peter actually loved Jesus. Like he was going all out for Jesus. And when you keep reading, it shows you that Peter was just someone that was quick to react quick to say something that he probably didn't know what it meant. So after he acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah, meaning Holy One, Savior and Deliverer, Peter still went after, against what God said. So that showed me that the number one thing, so I want you guys to put number one, the number one thing that unhealthy emotions do is that they blind you. Because it blinded Peter from seeing who he already declared that Jesus was. So that's the number one thing that emotions, unhealthy emotions make you do. The second thing unhealthy emotions do is lead you to dishonor God. I don't know if you guys paid attention to what Jesus said, but he told Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's like the biggest insult someone can get if you follow Jesus. And he said, you are a stump, basically a stumbling block to me, for you're not setting your, things, your mind on things of God, but on things of men. So emotions blind you, and emotions lead you to dishonor Jesus. The, um, we're going to go into the next one with Peter, and it was Matthew 26, 31 through 35. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, 
Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night. And he's talking to Jesus like Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. And Jesus just tells him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me. How many times? Three. Three times. Can everybody stand up really fast? All you guys are taking notes. That's so obedient. Good job. Stand up and like shake. Ooh. Yeah. Now like scream. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good. You guys are learning about the Bible and about what we can do to have healthy emotions. So, okay, sit down and keep writing notes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start from 35. After Jesus told him, you're going to deny me three times. Then Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. How many of you believe him at this point? That he's, we're pretty convinced. Nobody? Okay, that means you read the Bible. Good job. Um, how many of you are convinced that maybe he's telling the truth? Because each time Jesus says something, he completely disagrees. Like he's like, no way. I would die with you. I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. So the other thing emotions does is emotions lead you to empty promises and guides you to please others. So why do emotions lead you to empty promises? I don't know if you guys have ever been through this, but maybe in a relationship with a guy or a girl. When you're emotional, you make promises like, I'm never going to leave you. I would never go with anybody else. Or if the guy or the girl has hurt you before, I would never hurt you. That was the last time. And that's why, <laughs> that's why a lot of times we end up in a cycle because we're just living out empty promises. We never live out healthy emotions. It's always unhealthy emotions and living by these empty promises that emotional people are telling us. And that can sometimes be us. Or when we sin and we tell Jesus, okay, that was the last time I'm going to do that. I promise. That was it. And we make these empty promises and then we feel bad because we keep doing it. So that's why emotions lead you to empty promises, unhealthy emotions. And it also guides you to please others. Something I love to do is like dissect what I read. And that I've always done that even in school, not just with the Bible. And something that I noticed was in Matthew 26, 31, it said, Jesus said to them. So them shows me that it wasn't just to Peter. Peter was amongst other people, the other disciples. So it was with other people around. So when Peter responded and spoke out loud, even if I must die with you, I will not deny, with you, deny you. It showed me that unhealthy emotions guide you to please others because he wasn't by himself. So his response was to show the other disciples, this is who I am to Jesus. I stand firm. And even though it's beautiful, if he really did it, he was speaking against what Jesus did and in front of others. So emotions, write that down too. Lead you to empty promises and guide you to please others. Okay. Matthew 26, 69 through 75. This is when you guys are going to realize that Peter was just crazy emotional. This chapter is on the plot against Jesus. So basically what Jesus said in chapter 16 was coming true. He was getting denied, arrested, and accused. So now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus, the Galilean, but he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you mean. This was 30 verses after he just said to Jesus, I will die with you. 30 verses, which shows in our age, it shows like he's like bipolar. But genuinely, it's because he had unhealthy emotions. And that's something that we can all struggle with. It's not that we're all bipolar. It's just that we're living by the flesh. So he literally 30 verses said, I don't know what you mean. Like, I never heard of that guy. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus. And again, he denied it with an oath. Does anybody know what an oath is? You can say it, the one with the mask. I'm sorry? A promise. So what we just learned was that emotions lead you to empty promises. So he just promised Jesus, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. 
And then this random girl that said, he was with Jesus. He denied it with a promise. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you two are one of them. So this is the third time. It's not the first, second. He already denied him one and, once and twice. This is the third time. Certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse. He is so dramatic. Why did he have to do the most? He's cursing and getting mad and swearing when he was just saying, Jesus, I'm all for you. And now he's mad, cursing, promising, just going crazy. And he says, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So, of course, like us, after you make a mess, then you cry and you feel bad because you're living not the way that Jesus calls us to live. So the last thing that unhealthy emotions does is lead you to denying Jesus. So the way that we live, if we have unhealthy emotions, we're living a life that denies who Jesus is. So we may call ourselves Christians, but then we live a life of denying him because of our unhealthy emotions. Because we're constantly feeding our flesh and feeding our passions and desires, and we lose sight of who Jesus calls us to be. So the second way to live in order to have healthy emotions, so we already talked about unhealthy emotions. We can all relate to having moments like Peter, is to live a spirit-led life. So the spirit is a life that is full submission to Jesus. So that makes it difficult because, like I said earlier, the flesh is our, na our natural self that wants to react and wants to do things that are tempting. But a full submission to Jesus shows that it's out of obedience. And even though you don't feel like it, that's what we're called to do in order to conquer these unhealthy emotions. So in Romans 8.8, 8, it says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It's that simple. So a lot of times we try to overcomplicate things. Like, well, I'm pleasing him like this. Like on Wednesdays, I raise my hands during worship. I talk to people. But then at school, you know, I'm not that spiritual. It's more like fleshy at school. In Romans 8, it says, if you're in the flesh, you can't please God, period. So you're either feeding your flesh or feeding your spirit. There is no in between. So I'm going to call my husband and Bryce up, please. They're going to help me with an example. Don't be too excited. We're all waiting. Look at them. Look at Bryce so tall. My husband tall. Everybody's tall. I'm Bryce. No. Which one was, which one? You're blue? I'm blue. Yeah, yeah. And you're white. Okay. So, like I was saying, you're either feeding your flesh either feeding your flesh, okay, or you're feeding your, you can stand up with, yeah, thank you, or you're feeding your spirit. So when you feed your spirit, your flesh dies down. Good. And then when you're feeding your flesh, what does that do to your spirit? Huh? It dies down. It kills it. So that shows us that you can either feed one or the other. You can't have both of them blown up, and you can't have both of them like that, flat. They both have to be full. I mean, I'm sorry. One has to be full, either flesh or spirit. Okay, everybody clap for Bryson and my husband. Yeah, you can keep the balloon. Yeah. So there is no in between. You're either feeding the flesh, and when you feed the flesh, your spirit can't react anymore. It can't act because you're killing it. When you feed the spirit, your flesh goes down. Okay, you can live out of the spirit. You can have healthy emotions. So the first step we need to do in order to live a spirit-led life. So write number one. In capital letters. Deny yourself. So what does this mean? This makes you sound like you're insecure if you're constantly denying yourself. But if you do it with a spirit-led life, what that means is that we don't belong to this world. So even though this world belongs to the enemy, we are not called to adapt to these things. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed 
to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Like I said earlier, our mind is consumed by emotions. So that's how our emotions start, is with our mind and with choosing what life we're living, either a life of flesh or a life of the spirit. So be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That takes so much weight off your shoulders when you're living by the Spirit because you start living in what is good, acceptable, and perfect because you're understanding what God says. In Romans 6.6, 6, it says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So we're called to adapt to the things of Jesus, of being born again. We're not called to adapt to the things of this world because that would make us enslaved to sin and to unhealthy emotions. So denying yourself is realizing who you belong to. Number two. I want you guys to write a big number two. And it's pick up your cross slash crucify. It has to take place in your thoughts. When thoughts that aren't pleasing to God come to your mind, put them to death. And I know this sounds crazy with me telling you put this to death, put that to death. But what that means is denying yourself first, and that's how you put the flesh to death. Because like we showed you with the balloons, it's your choice to either feed one or the other. So how many of you want to feed the spirit? Good. How many of you want to feed the flesh? And you can be honest because the flesh is the easiest thing, but it's not what's best for you. And it's why a lot of times we seem confused because we feed our flesh and then we think, but this is not how I would act. Like, this is so irrational. I know a lot of times when I'm emotional, maybe with pregnant, it's a little bit harder to realize, but it's not an excuse. Before I was pregnant, I was still emotional. And a lot of times... It's you react and then you feel like, why did I react like that? Like you, once nobody's around because then you'll be embarrassed if you did something and people are around and you're thinking, why did I react like that? So when you're by yourself, I would always think, what was the point of me saying that or screaming that or whatever? And it's because it's not us. It's not how we were made to be. We were made to adapt to who Jesus says we are. So everything has to take place in your mind and you put it to death. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What this shows me is that in order to not be in the devil's way, in the enemy's way of him always tricking you and making you fall, is to be of sober mind. Our minds are always sometimes so clouded with emotions that we lose sight of who we're following all the time. We lose sight because the enemy is ready. He's thinking, oh, wow, she's thinking about this, 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 and that, so I'm going to attack her through here. And we feel so tormented a lot of times because we're stuck in the same place. In Colossians 3, 5, it says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and idolatry. Something that I find so beautiful, even though this verse is telling you all, like, the sins that we need to get rid of, something that I find beautiful is that it's not saying put to death what, what you are. It's saying put to death what is earthly in you, which means that it's something that doesn't have to belong to you. It doesn't belong to you. It's that when we walk on this earth and in the world, we start adapting to things that didn't belong to us in the first place. So I think it's beautiful that Jesus, when he's telling us to put to death those things he's not saying put to death what you already are impure um, with evil desire he's not saying that he's saying what's earthly in you remove the things that have been adapted in your life in order to live a life of healthy emotions so I want to ask you guys what are things in your life that you need to surrender to Jesus daily in order to walk out the life that he calls us to live a spirit-led life with healthy emotions. And maybe you guys are thinking, I have healthy emotions. Like when I pray, I feel good. I feel in the morning like I can do this. But it's not a walk, a daily walk that when something comes your way, you know how to react, react the right way. 
So what are things in your life? Is it a relationship that keeps your mind dwelling on things of this world? Like impurity. If you're in a relationship that constantly brings impurity in your life or thought, negative thoughts that you know don't align to what God says. Or is it music that you're feeding yourself with all day that consumes your mind? So music is something that a lot of times we take lightly. Because a lot of times we think, oh, I just like the beat. Like, everybody knows this song. I like the beat. It's cool. But if you're adapting all the time to things that are to the music that's going in your ears all day, you start, what, adapting to that. So then your emotions start being unhealthy and you start feeding anger, impurity, lust, because that's everything that you're consuming your mind with. And again, that's where emotions start is in your mind. If we go back. Here we go. Flip your page to emotions or turn it over or whatever. Emotions are an impulse that moves in a living thing to action, prompting reactive behavior that has been adapted. So what action are you going to take? Angry. Angry action, like actions with anger and impurity because that's what you're dwelling on all day. And the last thing that I want you to ask you guys, ask you guys, ask yourselves is are your eyes aligned to the things of this world? So that doesn't mean that it's a sin to think that a car is cool. That's not a sin because I think classic, when I see a classic car or a punch buggy, I'm like, wow. Like it's not a Ferrari or anything like that. It's just like a classic car. I love it. So that doesn't mean that you're sinful because you like things, but are they aligned to it? Does it make you follow that so that your eyes are always ready to look at girls or men, at cars, like you're consumed by the things of this world. The third thing, so wait, I'm sorry. Picking up your cross is a daily action, and it's not an easy thing to do on your own, which leads me to my last point. So you're going to write number three, and in capital letters, follow him. The only way to follow him is to know what he says and to choose to obey. How many of you love to obey? your favorite thing wow okay now you guys are being honest so obedience is so difficult because you don't feel like it it doesn't feel good if someone tells you to do something you feel like why or why do I have to do it right now and that's rebellious like rebellion that can be even put in our minds with the music because we feel like we don't have to do what people say because I got everything under control I can do whatever I want and we get this attitude of thinking we know who we are when in reality, we're slipping away with unhealthy emotions and have no idea who we are. So the only way to follow him is to choose to obey and do what he says. So when we adapt to who Jesus is, we are born again. And we stop reacting and we start acting. So like I said with emotions, you, it's an automatic reaction. So it's something that's impulsive. When it happens, you react. If someone's mean, you're mean back. If they're nice, you're nice back. So it's a constant reaction. But when you live by what Jesus says, you start acting, which means that when someone does something, instead of you reacting, you stop and think, how would I act to go against this? So if someone's hateful, you love them. And you're, like I said, you're not going to feel like it. You're going to seem, the enemy's going to say, oh, you're fake. You know you want to yell at them. But that doesn't mean that you have to follow the things of this world. So in Galatians 5, 25, well, 22 to 25, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. What Jesus showed me with this is that right after he tells us how to act and not react, it says that we have crucified our flesh with passions and desires. So he's already showing us that we're not going to feel like it. It's not going to feel good. We're not going to feel good in the moment. But afterwards, we know who we are and we become stronger in the Spirit to build these healthy emotions. So I want to end with this. I know a lot of you may feel discouraged because you feel like you've been a Peter your whole life, or the majority of it, that when it comes to what's convenient to you, you don't deny Jesus. You're all for him, and you're ready to please him. But then in moments where the flesh wants to take over, it's so quick to deny him. 
and to quickly forget about what it means to live a spirit-led life. So I want you guys to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm going to read this over you. Um, and it's the story, well, I'll just tell you. It's a story about Peter again. But this time it's an acts. And this is when he um, is filled with the Holy Spirit. And they're telling him, stop talking about Jesus. And you're going to go to jail. And they're threatening him and doing this and that. And Peter stands firm in the spirit. And he's able to conquer not deny Jesus, but follow him. And it says at the end, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. So true repentance takes place when you follow Jesus. Just like Peter repented and was able to be full of the Holy Spirit and be used by him and transformed from an unhealthy man with unhealthy emotions to a man with healthy emotions. Father God, I thank you for each and every one of these students. God, I thank you because um, they have the willingness and choice to choose whether they're going to live by the flesh or the spirit, God. So I pray that you would give them strength and that they would choose to deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow you, Lord. I thank you because we all have the power to do that, and you're proud of us, and you see our tries and our needs. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.